In our text today, Paul can encourages us to press on for something here. He encourages us, in spite of all the things that are happening around the world, I'm sure that um, we have reason to rejoice and we have something to press forward here. And we need to grasp that today. So I'd like to start with a man by the name of John Bunyan. He was the most famous of the Puritan writers of his time. He was born in England. Um, he is well known for his book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Have you read it? Many of you have. I have. In fact, I've read it at least twice. Because I was really impressed with the um, sequence of a dream he uses in the form of allegory. I'm not sure if his uh, story is based on real dreams he had or uh, out of his um, sanctified imagination. I'm not sure. But I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he is actually from his own dreams maybe God has given him. Because um, um, in the allegory written during Bunyan's 12 years imprisonment, it is not published until 1678. And do you know what his crime was for being in prison for 12 years? Yes, preaching without a license issued by the government. But praise God, while in prison, he was inspired to write this novel. And uh, this is uh, one of the most printed books in history. In 1658, he was indicted for preaching without a license. And the immortal allegory that Bunyan crafted in his prison house was set in the framework of a dreams. Now that alone grabbed my attention when I first encountered this book because the Lord had given me many dreams in my life. And one day I would like to write a book myself if God would permit me in the sequence of dreams that God had given me. Well, that may never be materialized, but I, that's one of my hopes I have. The entire book is presented as a dream sequence. Christian and hopeful, two main characters in the book. Christian and hopeful make it through the dangerous enchanted ground place where the air makes them sleepy and if you go to sleep you're not going to wake up and they cross the dreaded river of death on foot and then on to Mount Zion and finally to this celestial city and Christian has rough time going through this process because of his past sins wearing him down. But guess what? The hopeful came to his rescue. And they were welcomed into the celestial city finally. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I, as I went through this book, the most notable, notable spiritual lesson I have gathered was this. God's plan is progress, not perfection. Now we ourselves are imperfect, living in an imperfect world, surrounded by imperfect people, and happy is he who keeps that in mind. You're 
probably heard about a couple who was looking for a perfect church, right? And they were looking everywhere and visiting all the churches far and near, and they couldn't find perfect church. And one day they were inspired to finally visit one more time, and this church happened to be the church right across from their home. <laughs> so they went and visit, and and they finally thought, well, this is the perfect church we are looking for. And the fr- members were friendly, and they have a correct doctrine in Sims, and, and uh, they had everything right. Graceful church, an active church. Until they realized the church became imperfect just because they joined that church. When the couple joined the perfect church, the two imperfect couple made it imperfect. So here we go, our text today, starting with verse 12. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, But I press on. Amplified Bible says, not that I have already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like, or have already been made perfect. Remember, God's plan is about what? Progress, the blank. You have the sermon note today, uh, number one. The plan, God's plan, is progress, not perfection. Would you agree with that? You know, um, Philip's translation renders it in very plain English. He says, I do not consider myself to have arrived. Now, that's always danger especially for those who have been Christian for a long time, it's easy to become a professional Christian. (coughs) That you look down at the struggles of others and go, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that person. Easy to become insensitive to sin because you think you're above it. Martin Luther remarked it, that pride is so deep within us that we must repent of our repentance. What do you think he means, that we must repent of our repentance? I think he means by that, um, by saying that, uh, he meant that even our repenting is stained with pride. (laughs) <laughs> Look at me, I'm honest en- enough to repent of my sin. I'm not like you. I, I'm not hiding anything. Um, I don't cover things up. So I believe Martin was saying that sin is so deep within us that even our confession contains within it the seeds of our next transgressions. So if you ever think you have finally arrived, think again. If you ever think, oh, I'm ready for translation, think again. (laughs) How many of you think you're ready for translation this morning? Oh, I met many Adventists who claim that they're ready for translation. I kid you not. Well, we should be ready, right? We should be ready for translation. There's no question about that. But have you arrived it? Have have you arrived? That's another question. So Paul says, I, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but what? I press on. I press on 
to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Pause for a moment what he says here. Take a look at what he says. Christ Jesus took hold of me. What does that mean? Jesus took hold of me. Does that mean Christ found me? He initiated my salvation. He saved me. Christ has a purpose for my life. So when I look at this text here in verse 12, I press on to take, take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. But what that tells me is that Christ has a purpose for my life. That's point number two here in our study guide. Christ has what? Has a purpose in my life. Now, is it important to have a purpose in your life? Yes. I see people, especially young people these days, who is going about everywhere uh, as though they have no purpose in life. And I'm sad. And I read, I read a, um, about a psychologist um, who was wandering about his life when he was young. He didn't know why he was, why he is here and why he is living for. And, and finally he f thought he figured it out. He said to himself, okay, I want to become a writer. He grew up a little further and then he realized that wasn't enough purpose for his own life. And so he had to ask for the question, why do I become a writer? And then he thought to himself, okay, I was being bullied a lot when I was young. I want to help those who are being bullied. I want to help those who are being bullied, and I want to help them to cope with the bully situation. And that's what he went for. Since then, he had written many articles about the subject. And he's being happy doing what he's, what he's doing because he, does, he did found purpose in his life. You know, when you have a purpose in life, did you know you, you can live longer? That's the fact according to a research and, and that's a proven fact about, uh, from the sci sci scientific approach. You live longer you, you, and happier as well. You'll be happier. You can tolerate, you can cope with the pain in life way better than if you did not have a purpose in life. You can handle pain much better. You can protect, protect against heart attack even. You know? You can prevent Alzheimer's disease. You can do many wonderful things when you have a purpose in life and, and within the boundary that God has set within us. You know, all these wonderful occupations out there. Whatever you do in life, whether you are a gardener or whether you are a writer or a teacher or whatever you are engage, being engaged within that boundary, you can be happy and you can live for a purpose. But in verse 13, Paul goes on to say, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Are you looking at it? Verse 13. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but 20 things I do. Is that what he says? How many things? Not two or three? What about five things I do? No, he says one thing. One thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Note the fierce concentration implicit, implicit in this word. One thing I do. Here's a secret that applies across the board here. To excel in any area of life. 
a person must say this one thing I do. Not these 20 things I do. Single-minded focus in any endeavor generally wins a great reward. That's number three in our uh, study guide. So if we were to paraphrase this verse, fitting our personal circumstance, some of, some of us may say, a great artist must say, one thing I do. A gifted teacher must say, the one thing I do. A championship athlete must say, one thing I do. A single parent raising a child must say, one thing I do. A student who wants to graduate with honors must say, this one thing I do. The greatness in any arena comes to those who can say with the Apostle Paul, one thing, this one thing I do. And in this case, in his case, it meant, it meant looking to heavenly goal of winning the prize. Unfortunately, some pe many people say, many things I do. And Paul clarifies his purpose in life with two key phrases here. There's one thing I do. Number one, forgetting what lies behind. When famed missionary David Livingstone returned from Africa, he was asked by reporters, where are you ready to go next? His answer was, I am ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. Provided it to be forward. And this must be the attitude of the child of God every single day. Forgetting what lies behind. I met a few people I'm talking about Christian people, church members, Seventh-day Adventists, who will cling to their past and being stuck there in the past. No matter how I counsel them, they refuse to get out of that rut. And I, I don't understand how they are able to do that. Um, but they cling to their past and, and they don't seem to be able to get out of it. Paul was such a positive person with a great faith. Nothing could get him discouraged. The pen of inspiration says, whenever Paul was discouraged, do you know what he did? Yes, there were moments he was discouraged. Yes, there were moments that his hope faded away. There were moments when he felt like giving it up. Do you know one secret he had? Each time he was being discouraged, he was able to look at the cross. In fact, the pen of inspiration says, one glance at the cross, just one glance at the cross was enough for him to shake off discouragement and opposition of the enemy. The end of a quote. Let me say that once more. One glance at the cross was enough for him to shake off the discouragement and opposition of the enemy. Sketches from the life of Paul. That was his secret. Just one glance. 
So when you look at the cross, what do you see? What do you think Paul saw? When I see my cross, I see Jesus paying for my sins. When I see my cross, I see Jesus loves me. When I see cross, I see Jesus has forgiven my sins of the past, present, and future. When I see Jesus, when I see the cross, I see unselfish, lovely character of Jesus. So much so that one glance was enough for Paul to get up out of the rut and, and, and forgetting the past behind him and, and move on and press on forward. Just one glance at the cross. So we too need a daily, fresh inspiration in order to press on for the real issue of life. Daily, fresh inspiration. Paul gathered it from the cross. So how do I receive the fresh daily inspiration? Well, daily devotion, right? What else? Daily de devotion. Um, I know I, say, I had said this before, but I can say this each Sabbath. Daily devotion and prayer. One thing I do, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Basically, Paul is saying, you see, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. In fact, he might have said, I'm, I'm far from being perfect. But I know and God knows that I am doing the very best I can for him. People may hold my past for me over me, but God erased my past when I accepted Jesus into my heart, so I am not going to dwell on my past because Jesus plunged them into the depth of the sea and he, he no longer remembers my past. I'm going to forget the past and I'm going to look forward to my life in God's future. That's basically what Paul is saying here. He developed this overcoming attitude by reminding himself that God loved him. Jesus died for his past sin, present, and, and future sins. And that Jesus would never condemn him. You know what? You and I need to remind ourselves each time we are being attacked by the devil, each time we are being tempted, to commit sins, perhaps even on daily basis, we need to remind ourselves. And as we look at that cross, it should always remind of ourselves that God loved me and he died for me. And he had forgiven my sins. And he had called me. He had given me real purpose in life. So one glance, the cross was enough. I press on, verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Christ Jesus. So in our study guide, number four, blank is our goal. The heaven 
is our goal. If the heaven is really your goal, and then you are looking after Christ likeness toward the perfection. You're not there. I am far from being there, but I know I'm making my way. I'm striving. It is in progress. And Paul reminds us to remind us, remind of us of our true identity once we accept Christ. Go down to verse 20. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven. What is in heaven? The citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And verse 20 begins with a huge contrast here. The enemies of the cross live for earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. We need to remind ourselves daily that our citizenship is not here, but in heaven. And I'm sure these words have a special meaning for Philippians. Back in first centuries, you know, they were given special citizenship of Rome. They had Roman citizenship. And they, they had special treatment as being the Roman citizens. So when they heard that their citizenship is in heaven, I'm sure that had meant special to them. As the song says, the world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, right? We are just passing through here. Because our home is up there. Jesus is building a mansion for you and I. And Philippians 3 ends with that ringing declaration that one day God is going to re-schematic our earthly bodies. We will be transformed from inside out to top and bottom. We will be changed to an immortal body. We will be raised from the dead and re-engineered to be like Jesus' glorious body. And Jesus will do it by the same power that enables him to run the entire universe. Think about it. No more pain. No more wheelchairs. No more hospital visits. Hallelujah. No more ICUs and no more cancer and no more strokes and no more false teeth and no more diabetics and no more Alzheimer's and no more kidney failures and no more disease and no more death and hallelujah. And as I was choosing the closing hymn today, it reminded me of an early pioneers of our church by the name of Annie Smith. You know, she died at the age of 27. A little before her death, she composed a song which we are going to sing today. And uh, that song speaks so much about her desire to be in heaven. I might as well tell you how, how she became a Christian. Because she went to the academy and wanted to become a teacher she was offered an incredible position with a high salary. 
But her mother was afraid that their children, Uriah Smith and Annie Smith, she was afraid for her children to go worldly with high salaries and so forth and so on. So she was praying one day that God will help them to become a Christian because they have never given their heart to the Lord. Around that time, there was a preacher in town by the name of Joseph Bates. Have you heard of his, his name? And Joseph Bates had a dream one day. And uh, he, in his evangelistic meeting he was holding, uh, he saw the auditorium packed with the people. No, there was no uh, sitting areas left, except only one seat being left by the door of the entrance. It was jam-packed. And as he was getting up to preach the word, he saw a young lady walked in. And she quietly sat down at the last seat uh, by the door. Well, he thought nothing of it. So he was preaching in evangelistic series at that time. And, and, and next day, he, next evening, he was preaching. He was, and then, just like the dream, the lady walked in. It was jam-packed. Only one seat left by the door. And that lady sat right there by the door. So he remembered the dream as he was preaching. And he was very mindful of what he dreamed the night before. And as soon as the meeting was over, he walked right up to the lady and introduced himself. And, and they invited her to come back next day. And then a few nights later, it happens that Annie also had a dream. On the same day, uh, come same day, Joseph had a dream. And in the dream, Annie was in an evangelistic meeting. He saw Paul and gentlemen um, preaching the word of God. So as Joseph shared his dream, Annie also shared that dream. The preacher I saw in the dream was you. And the preacher said, the lady who walked into my evangelistic meeting was you. So she had given her life at that meeting. But she was struck down with a tuberculosis. She was an editor with the Review and, Review and Herald at the time, but she was dying. But just before he, her death, she had written a song, poem, and that is right here we, what we're going to sing today in the hymnal 439, How Far From Home. She was yearning to go home. She was yearning to go home. So Hannah, please come up and lead our closing song. As we think about the uh, progress, the pilgrim's progress, remember, we're not there yet. We are making progress.